The greatest leaders in business look for the emerging stories in their organization and use the data to choose their preferred outcome. What outcome do you want in your business? Listen to the stories of industry veterans, coaches, and consultants so you can choose your preferred business outcome. Hi, everyone. And welcome to a brand new episode of the Business Blind Spots Exposed podcast. Gosh, that's really long. I want to just call it BBSE from now on. <laughs> um, but let me tell you, if this is the first time that you've come to this podcast, what it's all about. And it started with kind of this personal journey. I used to think I'm a really smart guy. And then I realized that I can't be fi- smarter than the 50 best people st- uh, standing around me. So why don't I make them my friends so that they can help me increase my understanding of the world? Uh, my blind spots by just picking up the phone and calling them. And it started to make me a much more effective leader. And in the course of trying to see my blind spots, I meet people along the way, just like Jeannie and Kim. How, Jeannie and Kim, how are you all doing today? Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Uh, absolutely. I, and and I, I got to tell everyone, I'm really excited about this, uh, this conversation for a number of reasons. First of all, it affects me uh, on a personal level. This is a really interesting uh, topic for me, and that is uh, uh, Down syndrome, uh, trisomy 21. It's something that I will tell you, I didn't know a lot about myself until I had a child with Down syndrome. And it took me a little while to understand it. And I didn't realize how much of a gift it was uh, for my its expansive understanding and change shift of perspective in the world. Uh, and I met Jeannie and Kim because of Gigi's Playhouse. Uh, Jeannie? Do you mind telling people a little bit about uh, Gigi's Playhouse? I'd like to get them to know a little more about it. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much for having us um, to share and bring awareness about Gigi's Playhouse and what we do. So Gigi's Playhouse is a national organization. Uh, There are currently 55 brick and mortar playhouses um, around from coast to coast. And um, Gigi's Playhouse uh, Raleigh was the first one that started and we opened in June of 2016. And so I am the founder and current executive director. And what Gigi's Playhouse is, it's basically, it's programs. Um, We are a national Down Syndrome Achievement Center. Um, We're not a school, but we uh, um, have programs that are typically one hour long programs for all ages, um, from infant all the way to adult, as well as recently, most recently, I've had a number of conversations with prenatally diagnosed moms, um, getting that diagnosis and Googling it, not knowing what to do. And luckily Gigi's Playhouse comes up um, in their Google search now. And so they um, have called us and I actually just spoke with a new mom last Friday. And this is a new world to her. Um, She has two other children, um, but now she's all of a sudden has this Down syndrome world going to be put, um, that she's gonna be put a part of. And what does that mean? And so um, that's what we're here for. Um, we're here as a resource as, as, all, um, as well as an actual safe place to go. So my journey starts um, with my younger brother, Sam. Um, Sam is a 47 year old, old adult um, that has Down syndrome. Um, as you can see, I'm Korean and my parents are first generation. I'm second generation. They, come, they came over to the United States in the sixties. And so when Sam was born, um, he was, um, My mom was not told the greatest news and the most positive news. And um, she didn't have anyone to turn to. She didn't have anyone to call um, and didn't know what to do. And the resources that she was given was that he can go into institution and she can go on with her life. Um, She luckily didn't do that. And for we're very blessed to have Sam in our life. as I look back though at his sibling, as a sibling of his, I wish I was an advocate for him more um, because um, I think as an adult, he would be more, um, have a more fulfilled life if he had some resources like Gigi's Playhouse at a younger age. Um, so that, that, that's my why of um, why I feel it's so important to have a Gigi's Playhouse in as many communities as possible because uh, we provide a resource for the families. And so um, it's changed Sam's life, even when he started Gigi's in his 40s. Um, he's more engaged, um, he's more uh, social. And um, I think, and the mission of Gigi's Playhouse is to change the perception of Down syndrome. 
that they are very capable people. Yes, they do need a little extra help, but they're very capable. Um, And that's one of the things that um, I really put to the forefront of the Gigi's Playhouse in North Carolina was the adult programming. And um, I will bring Kim in to speak a little bit um, because of our adult programming. We really push that because um, there's many people, there's many people like Sam that are sitting home after school, post-secondary school, and not having many opportunities for them, employment being one of them um, and other opportunities. And so we really push the adult programming um, because um, Down syndrome is a journey and, um, you know, and you and getting opportunities in your community to be a part of um, our families is so important. Absolutely. Kim, I'd love to hear more about sort of the way you think of these programs and kind of maybe even your journey and why behind that coming to where you are. Sure, absolutely. Um, let's start with my journey because maybe that sort of gives some perspective as to, as to why I am where I am today. My journey really starts uh, as a 15 year old daughter of an educator, not a special educator, uh, just a regular high school social studies teacher in upstate New York. Um, but I, I think, and that was my dad, I think my dad had enough perspective on what it meant to impact people's lives educationally that he sort of had an impact on me as well. And so at 15, I started staffing summer camps for folks with disabilities in upstate New York, wild experiences out in the woods, in tents, in a lake, in a canoe, in all sorts of situations, but just fell in love with that population. And there's not just folks with Down syndrome, there's folks with all sorts of exceptionalities. So at 15, there starts my journey onward to college, a degree, onward to master's school or master's program, another degree, onward to teaching, consulting, and then winding up five years ago, maybe six years ago, uh, on Jeannie Hoffman's doorstep with my daughter looking for a place for her to volunteer. Um, Suffice it to say, when Jeannie Hoffman found out about my background, I wasn't going anywhere either. So we uh, started a journey together about just sort of how we can enrich the lives of adults with Down syndrome. Specifically, that was my area of interest. It seems that the littles and the middles had a lot of services already, maybe not enough, maybe not the most appropriate. Certainly we can do better jobs in in all those areas, but they were addressed by public school or other outside services. The adults were really a standalone group in the community, not connected, not enriched, not uh, able to access a a variety of programs or very many programs at all. So we put our focus there. What we built through Gigi's Playhouse was a series of programs that would really just do exactly that, connect our adults to the community, allow them to know who their community was and allow their community to know who they were because that was a connection that was very much missing, but is really integral in the human experience. So we started that. How did we do that? We did that with volunteer experiences. We did that with attending advocacy uh, opportunities like uh, like town expositions or town expo centers for, or town expo programs for um, just sort of general awareness of what programs exist in the community our folks could speak. We started that with even something as interesting, but relatively simple as making lunch for the firemen in a neighboring community so that in the event an emergency call was made by those firemen, they would have experience with our folks and our folks would have experience with them. Super, super important. We just put a lot of thought into what do those connections of our people, our adults with Down syndrome to the community and in the reverse, what do they look like? And we started creating experiences programs that contained experiences there. That has morphed to employment, which is fantastic. Um, And in a nutshell, what we are doing now is sort of raising the dialogue in the community about how and why folks with Down syndrome are highly employable. And we've been lucky enough to sort of, I think, put maybe seven folks by now into employment in the Raleigh community and we're not stopping. So uh, so we're kind of, that's where we are at the moment. We're, we're continuing with programming that raises connection between our people in the community and we're, we're continuing with programming that, that facilitates employment. So a couple of things come to mind as you all are speaking about this. And I will tell you, I mean, part of the reason I started this podcast is because I always find out it's not about having all the answers, it's about having, asking the right questions. So I always like to re-baseline how I think things, right? Am I even looking at things the right way? 
Um, what is what are some misconceptions or what are maybe some myths that people have about people with uh, Down syndrome that maybe it's, it's time to reset a little bit in terms of, and I think I'm talking about the adult community here, the population that has the capacity and the capability to do, what are maybe some misconceptions that maybe should be uh, righted or re- reset? Jeannie, you want me to take that one? Sure. Okay. Uh, I, I think the biggest misconception is that there is a lesser amount of ability than actually exists in the individual. So we know our folks have a range, just like any other human being, have a range of interests, a range of abilities. They have their own challenges. I mean, that variety of what exists inside those humans is the same in them as it is in in us. But I think because they wear their diagnosis on their face, the, the community, the employment community specifically, becomes maybe a little more intimidated by approaching the idea of employing those people. I don't think it's out of anything other than just lack of information. So, and and then these misconceptions that we're talking about. So biggest misconception, they don't, they may not have the right ability to work in our company or in our organization or in our business. I think that just stems from a lack of awareness. So Really, that's the biggest, I think that's the biggest driver. I have to, I have to be honest. I think that's the number one biggest driver. And then I think there is, with that lack of familiarity, I think there's just a little bit of discomfort in approaching the topic, which keeps people held back. Curiosity so, would be a great thing if we can promote that in this, in this podcast to create a, create a curiosity about these folks, lessen that concern or that unfamiliarity. I think it could go wide open. Well, so th- that, that's a really interesting topic. I mean, I, I, I you know, just before we started, I, I talked about this idea of my own innate curiosity, and it's just purely from this point of view of that as a leader, my interest is not being more efficient, rather more effective. And if I want to be more effective as a leader, I'm constantly asking, what, what don't I know? What don't I know? What is sort of the, on, on the other side of the next door? And I think there's an opportunity here to see that there's a whole population of people, and, and actually, I don't even actually know the stats. Maybe you can share that with me. A population of people that we can go and say, hey, uh, would you be interested in coming and showing up for a, for a job interview when right now so many people are not even showing up? I think there's a population who'd say, yeah, I'm, I'm interested. I'm capable. When? <laughs> is, is that a fair statement? Am I, am I thinking right there? I think that's a very fair statement. I think that's absolutely a fair statement for sure. Jeannie, why, why do you think that there is a, um, just a lack of awareness? Is it just because of the percentile of the population that has uh, Down syndrome? Is that just, they just don't, people don't see it often enough and that's why they're uncomfortable? Yeah, I would say so, so some statistics that I will share is um, one in 700 um, babies are born with Down syndrome and Down syndrome actually is the um, most common chromosomal condition. Mm. Um, and so with that said, though, um, Down syndrome, is, as Kim referenced, you know, they wear their diagnosis on their face. So they're very um, identifiable and. Um, at the same time, although there's that many, there's so many that don't know what Down syndrome is. And what we like to say, it doesn't, um, it shouldn't define, their diagnosis should not define who they are. Um, and we also know that you either have Down syndrome or you don't. Um, you either had the, the, you know, the extra chromosome, the third copy on your 21st chromosome set, or you don't. Um, there is no range of Down syndrome, so to speak. But as we know, and Kim and I know, and, and now you may also, you know, there is a range, you know, in regards to abilities, but I think a lot has to do, um, I'll be hundred percent honest. I think a lot has to do from the family support perspective, um, you know, and I'll take my personal family as an example, um, you know, culturally it was, it was not, um, it was not advertised that we had a son with special needs. And then um, when it was, it was, um, it was, it was, uh, not in a positive light, um, that we, that we, uh, that our family did go out, um, with Sam. And then it's the whole, it's that perception of, um, expectation. So, you know, my mom was told that he had very limited abilities, so she didn't expect anything from him. Mm-hmm. And, um, that's what we change here, you know, and now, um, 
with our young ones and our kiddos, because we do expectation, we do have to put expectations on them. And I think that changes because even as Sam, in my example, um, even in his forties, we've placed expectations on him now and he's grown so much. Um, and I'm sure Kim would admit to this from the very first time she met him to now of he's now expected to either behave a certain way or to do certain things. Whereas before his first 40 years of his life, he wasn't. And I think growing up that way, um, we know many of adults that their families took the perspective of you're part of this family and you're going to have the expectations placed on all the kids in this family. And so you will, you will do, you'll follow all the rules and do all this. And so those, um, I will say those individuals are, um, are, are, their abilities are, are much more advanced um, because expectations are put on them and they're pushed and they can be pushed. And that's what also um, the exposure of Gigi's Playhouse and our programs, we're all encouraging. And it's, it's, a, it's called the best of all philosophy that we have at Gigi's Playhouse, whatever the best of all. Now, I'm not saying that everybody comes to Gigi's and they're all have these um, on this end of the spectrum with abilities, you know, we have our whole range and, but the best of all philosophy is, is coming to that program. And, um, you know, one example I'll tell you is a yoga program that we have. One of our um, young um, teens that came, the parent was like really hesitant for this 45 minute program. And she said, he won't sit still for five seconds. Well, we said, okay, well, we'll take five seconds, but maybe next week when he comes, it may be 10 seconds. Now he sits the whole 45 minutes on his mat and he enjoys it and he's learning. And that's what I think Gigi's is about. And it's about expectations. So uh, it's something I, you know, as I keep writing my notes here, as I'm kind of resetting my, my thinking, right. Uh, I think I heard something to the effect of not lesser capability than typical everyday humans. I think that's kind of par- paraphrasing a little bit of what you said, Kim. Tell, tell me a little more about that. What, so it, it, the, way, the way people present sometimes with Down syndrome makes you wonder if, uh, I wonder if they're getting what I'm saying. Uh, I, I've seen people react that way. I think you've got evidence to the contrary, at least with these seven people. Can you maybe give me some stories or kind of maybe a lot of those journeys or kind of what it, how it, how it looks today? Um, sure. I think, I think, um, we we'll have to go back to this idea that, that folks with Down syndrome wear their diagnosis on their face. Right. Um, along with the things that Jeannie said, I would add historically the way our world, our country specifically, that's really all I can, I can really speak to because of my experience and, and my studying of history. Our country had a, a particular way of, of viewing people with disability as a whole group, not just folks with Down syndrome, but as a whole group. We are an evolution now about what we know and what we believe in about folks with disabilities. And so things are opening up a bit more. We're starting to ask these questions. We're starting to have these conversations like we are today. So back to your original question about why, where is that discomfort and and lack of familiarity coming from? I think it comes from a history of sort of the way we've always viewed things. We're opening that up now. And that is a beautiful thing. And thank goodness for these conversations. So When we put our folks into employment, we often are met, often, often, often are met at the beginning with people who have lesser expectation because the assumption is there's lesser capability. That's the way it comes to us in terms of the way folks view our our, our people, our, our newer employees, the newest employees that we're job coaching. And that's sort of the capacity that we're in. They're the new employee. We're paralleling them as a job coach. And this is where we see these things. Um, we get a lot of people who meet us with that sort of, I, I want to try, I don't really know, I'm not really sure, and, and I'm, but I'm fairly sure that they can't do, and that the thought process starts there. So we have, we have perceptions of, of, of people in that way that result in interactions that might sound like somebody saying, well, I mean, would this be really too hard? I don't know if this would be the right thing. I, I think maybe, um, you know, they're going to have to alphabetize here. I, probably pretty sure they don't know how to do that. You know, questions like this, I'm trying to think of, of these people that I've had in different places. Um, do you think so-and-so would be bored just doing this? Or is this just too simple? But maybe it's right. Like there's just this constant, almost thinking aloud from, from their head to us about, uh, it just it's just a, a display, a constant sort of stream in the beginning of what they don't know. 
and the assumptions that they made. Sometimes it comes out directly. Sometimes they come out indirectly as they're trying to be as sensitive and correct as they can in their dialogues with us. But what happens in fairly short order is we as job coaches, we as program leaders, we as volunteers at Gigi's, when we have, when we have those situations in front of us, we model those expectations that Jeannie was referring to in the piece that she just said, we model language that is the same type of conversation that you and I would have with each other. We model those interactions and we say, we dispel verbally, we dispel as much as possible, as quickly as possible. And we say, you, you if you're going to be in this and this is your choice and we believe in it a million percent for you and for anybody else who asks, we ask that you respect the dignity of the years of these folks and that they have been on this planet, speak to them like they're adults, expect what you should be able to expect. We'll set appropriate expectations with you. Like keep it at the same level as you would anybody else. When you bump into their down syndrome and you see a legitimate challenge, we'll find a workaround. But until then, they're just another human being. Does that answer your question? I think it does. And, and there's a lot of, I hear a lot of airplay to this idea of DEIB, right? Diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging. Uh, and I mean, it's the same message, right? You, yes. You've got, uh, you, you are a triangle as a leader, right? You built this company, you, you're in that role, whatever the case may be, whatever the context is, that journey to that place where you got to. And you've got these 10, 15, hundreds of people on your team it's time to start to understand that not everybody's a triangle. Some people are squares, some people are octagons, <laughs> diamonds, and each one of them has their beauty. Don't discount it for not being a triangle, just like you. I have a story for you. I was just thinking, as you asked me that, I was trying to, I feel like every single job coaching experience I've had in the last year, it just all went bleh, right into my head and got all jumbled. But I do have a story for you. This one gal we put into employment into an office in, in downtown Cary. She's an office administrator, office assistant. She has various um, varying jobs there. One of the initial tasks that she had was to run their photocopier. And she could do it with great ease. She, she had plenty of, of experience with those types of things. She brought all that experience forward um, and, and she could do it with no problem. A few weeks later, the gal who's sort of directing her advancement in that office, and really it's an advancement for the first several months. We start with a list of tasks that we know are appropriate and they can be highly su successful on. Everybody can be highly successful. And then we encourage the evolution of that list into, into bigger and greater and more complex things because we know that ability is there. Um, so one of those advancements came with an ask for this gal to run a photocopier that photocopied giant blueprints. Like it's four feet across and eight feet long. I mean, it's enormous. So the feeding process into the machine is different. Well, the ask came something like this. Uh, I don't know, Kim, maybe this is too big. Maybe still with that trepidation, still with that hesitancy, maybe this is too big. And I, I, I but, but our gal, our, our employee said, oh no, no, oh no, no, I can do that. I can do that. And I looked at the, the, the sort of manager woman and I said, do you hear that? Because there's your answer. And so off they went, the two of them, to that giant photocopier, which was even intimidating to me. I was like, I don't know. I don't know if I would want to touch that thing either. But man, brave as ever, competent, confident. And she did exactly what she was asked on the first time around. And now that is one of her tasks. Not only eight and a half by 11 pieces of paper, but these eight feet by four feet or whatever the heck they are, enormous things. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's just a matter of experience and just dipping your toe in it. Just get curious, find out. You will be pleasantly surprised. So something that uh, is coming to me, and, and Jeannie, I want to ask you about this, right? Uh, you, you use this word expectations, expecting others, right? And, and I will tell you as a leader, having run multiple different companies, what's clear in my head, uh, communicating that with someone else doesn't necessarily mean it's clear in their head. And that that is one of the major challenges of leadership, at least for myself through most of my career, mm -hmm. uh, trying to make sure that we're in sync there. And it sounds to me that, uh, Kim, from what you're proposing, is that that same, it's the same exact problem. It's not something new. We're not introducing a new variable here. And Jeannie, to your point, it's, 
It's just setting those clear expectations. I mean, that's basic leadership science right there, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It is. Exactly. And, you know, and it's it, it's at all levels, really. Um, I have to share one story when Kim's referring to this young lady. Um, you know, it, it, this kind of sums it up on her first day. Um, Kim shared this with me because Kim was her job coach. First day, Kim's like, you know, so how how was your day? And she just said, I'm just glad to be one of them. Oh. That's. That's it. That's, um, yeah. Yeah. Gosh. That's the beautiful human it, side of it. We yeah. can talk about tasks and work all day long, but there is a human side to it that is just more beautiful than anything. Yeah. You know, I, I often say, even, even to my own, my, my own thinking and to my own uh, team, gosh, if I can tell you what to do and you do it, you're going to do it at some degree of um, conviction. But if I can help you see why it's in your best interest, I don't have to push you anymore. <laughs> you mm-hmm. start running at a thousand miles an hour. I won't be able to keep up with you, which I think is a fantastic option for a manager of any at any level, right? Yeah. And and what I'm hearing is that has happened, right? They 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 are bought in, they are contributing, they are starting to provide solutions to problems that someone else says, I don't know if this is actually even doable at all. And they're because different. because they digest this. They're more alike than different. If you can really live that philosophy, both about our folks with Down syndrome and about anybody with differences or exceptionalities in any way, shape or form, as you walk this planet, you develop that curiosity, that need to connect, you develop that for yourself. And then I think you project that into your community. If you can walk that statement and live that statement more alike than different, you see things differently. And that transition happens in our people. And I I know Jeannie would wholeheartedly agree that transition happens in employers. It happens in program leaders. It happens in volunteers. It happens every single time you say, I'm going to get rid of that discomfort. I'm going to get curious. I'm going to try. And and when you do, you realize more alike than different. Hmm. Jeannie, um, you know, one in 700, that means, you know, just doing the math, you know, it's 330 million people in the United States. There's, there's a pretty sizable population of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we think about what, you know, there's some significant population of adults then that have the capacity. Uh, is it, do you think it's just that people have never even considered the option that there's this talent pool that they can, I mean, everyone today is talking about, you know, the great resignation. My people are walking out the door I don't even know why they're walking out the door. Managers, leaders, frustrated everywhere. Right. Uh, but it's almost like the secret that's not a secret is sitting right here. And they probably just walked past you and you didn't even see them. Is, is that kind of how you, is that kind of your perspective on what's happening right now? Yeah. And I would say, um, I think Gigi's Playhouse has, has created actually a platform for um, companies and businesses to reach out to. Um, because I will say this, that, even before Gigi's, um, you know, when I heard about it in 2015, um, there was no place, you know, there was no place for um, this population. And um, that is what really, um, I believe that Gigi's has, has created. It's a platform for companies, let's say, that do want to employ um, somebody with an intellectual um, developmental disability or other varying abilities, but they don't know where to go. And so I think what Gigi's has created is it's a platform for them to to um, call and say, hey, you know, I have an opportunity Um, to your point, though. I think it's just about education is a big thing and awareness. I still will meet people um, that have misconceptions of Down syndrome, that they think that they can catch it from my brother walking in subway. I, I am not kidding you. This just happened on his last visit with me. Um, it, it's, it's amazing. So education is a big part of it as and, well. And let, let's dispel it. That's not, that's not possible. <laughs> that's not possible. Correct. That is not that's possible. Way, shape, or form. No. <laughs> Correct. Um, but it, it's, you know, when I, I think it's really, it's education too, you know, and, and that's, that's a big part of it as well. Um, but I think it, you know, it goes back to, um, we, Gigi's Playhouse, we, we, um, we have welcome windows that show Down syndrome. 
You know, we want to be part of the community. We're in shopping centers. You know, we're in and our new facility that we're going to be moving is downtown Kiri. We're going to be in the Walker. I mean, wow. Talk, talk about a destination place. Um, we are super thrilled about that. Um, being right next to downtown Kiri Park, we are going to have so much exposure. Um and we're a Down Syndrome Achievement Center. You know, we're, you know, we're, um, we're not this big box store or, or, or high-end place. We are a Down Syndrome Achievement Center, and that is huge. And um, I really think that this exposure is going to give us more opportunities for employers to come um, to us. Um, one of the big programs that we're trying to start, that we're trying to launch that Kim was really instrumental in is job coaching. Um, is, is being able to, because not everybody is, is, is exactly the same. Um, you know, the employee, the employee that um, Kim is referring to um, with another em- employee that is at another place, you know, they have differing abilities. And so we have to uh, obviously adjust to that um, with the employer's needs, um, as well as um, just kind of, you know, their tasks at hand. But uh, that's where we're trying to make that difference and have that engagement. So we make them successful because, you know, again, back to expectations, we want them successful. Um, they want to be successful. And, um, you know, there's this, there is this whole stigma of, you know, always like they can't do it. They can't do it. It's always about, they can't. And we're all about what they can do. And it's changing that language and changing that dialogue of what they can do and focus on what they can do. Yeah. They may not be able to do all those other things, but they can do this. And let's focus on that and what they can do. And trust me, if they can do something, they will be so proud and they will make you proud as an employer. And um, it's again, that good feeling of being part of a team. Um, you know, that that's what they want. They just want to be like everybody else. You know, my brother wants to be, you know, in an apartment and get married just like his older sister. It's, it's that whole thing of just, you know, he knows everybody works, so he wants to work. You know, it's that feeling of everybody just being part of that whole community. And that's, that's the end of the day. That's everyone wants purpose um, at the end of the day. And um, whatever that purpose is, um, we're going to try to hope fulfill it. And hopefully these small business, these businesses um, that reach out to us that, um, you know, providing that purpose for this population. So, um, all right. So let's say somebody has been listening to this and they're saying, huh, I didn't know this. I'm right now. I'm, I'm I'm kind of we're a bunch of sharks fighting over chum in the seas, right? And there's this other area that I can find a talent set that nobody else is even looking at. I mean, it's it's kind of the secret. That's not the secret. Uh, how how do you? Uh, and and I don't know, Jeannie or Kim, who 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 should answer this or who wants to? How do they start? I mean, if they want to start and say, all right, I'd like to take the first step. Do they go through a regular interview process? Walk us through what you do, Kim, perhaps in, in this program that what you set up with people. So the first thing I would say is to make a phone call to Gigi's Playhouse. Okay. Uh, before I continue answering that question, I want to say that that we understand as an organization that is that is um, significantly in the advocacy world for folks with Down syndrome, that it is scary and that there is some unknown and that there is some lack of familiarity that will sort of impact confidence in, in making a, an experience like that successful on both sides. So we stand at the ready to play that in between. The job coach has an integral job right there to sort of be the supporter both for the employer and the employee and make sure that that experience is successful. So given that, that being said, the first step is to make a phone call to Gigi's Playhouse or an organization like Gigi's Playhouse that has the capacity to guide that process. Um, and so once that happens, Somebody like me or me will call back, communicate back and say, let's have an initial conversation about just exactly what you're thinking. I will weigh in from the Down syndrome side and tell you, yay or nay, maybe not that specifically, maybe a bit more gray, like, okay, could be, let's say, put that up front. Let's move that back a little bit. Like, Let's just really explore what that looks like trying to build, again, just a smidge more familiarity, um, a bit more clarity, which makes everybody feel comfortable for the most part in the beginning steps. And then once that happens, the next step is if we go forward, and typically we do, the next step is that I go to the place of employment or somebody like me goes to the place of employment and really has a deep dive into what the actual role looks like and conversations on the spot with the, with the people involved, the people who are starting the process from their business end or their organization end, 
Um, and we really talk about it in context. Once that happens, then we go on to trying to find somebody to, to be a great match for that particular role. But it's really all about um, some, some step-by-step -step facilitation that starts with an interest phone call made to us or an organization like us. So I'm just making some notes for myself here because I want to play back a little bit of what I just heard from you. So, and, and, and what I'm hearing throughout this is, you know, as, a, as opposed to going to someone off the, off the street or, in, you know, indeed.com or whatever else it is, you're just getting them. In this case, you're actually kind of getting a whole support system behind it. Absolutely. So it's not that you, it's almost to some degree reducing or mitigating your risk of <laughs> pulling someone because yes. look, as an organization, Gigi's Playhouse has a reputation they want to be able to stand behind. They don't want to talk about seven. They want to talk about eight. They want to talk, talk about 90, right? Correct. So you've got an organization and a bunch of people dedicated to this cause who want to see success. You see that individual who wants to see success. You've got three parties here uh, and you don't get that with the average Joe off the street, <laughs> right? So, you know, so re reading between the lines there, you know, that those are some benefits as a leader of a company or a manager in a company who's looking to, for find, to find someone to fill a spot uh, that you have those extra, uh, that, that, those extra check marks in your favor, right? You also don't have the competition because a lot of people don't know about it, right? Mm -hmm. But it is, and, and the process that you go through here is that there's what I call the uh, the first the qualification is that is that really what you're looking for, right? Is is it a good? Right. Is, so that's done through a discovery. There's creation of that clarity as to will this match in terms of what you're looking for and kind of the the people that we can bring to the table here. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when you do the site visit and ultimately that candidate match. So there's. It's a matching process. I mean, to all in, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, seems like Kim, to some degree, you're kind of like a, a recruiter to, in the sense that you're bringing the right talent to the table you, and you understand yeah. both sides and you, you broker that relationship to happen. Is that a yeah, fair way I, to I characterize all really that? Fair. Mm -hmm, I think that's really fair. I've never been called a recruiter before in that capacity. <laughs> like that. Yeah, we're going to we're going to add that to her resume. Her, she's the Gigi recruiter. <laughs> oh, I think that's great. I think actually that's kind of brilliant, Jeannie. You take that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's exactly right. Really hiring the right person is, is about making the right match anyway at the end of the day for both expectations and for performance. So we're looking at that as well. And we're looking strongly at that. We very much only want highly successful experiences in this work that we do. And so we spend a lot of time um, exploring on both sides. So yeah, I think that's exactly right. I, I really think we know, and I would, I would maybe it's an unsafe assumption, but I would assume that any other organization or people who do what we do specifically know that part of our job is to provide that support on the employer side because we are breaking down barriers. We are breaking down expectations or assumptions rather. We are building expectations. We are changing the mindset of what it means to hire a person with Down syndrome. We are changing the way the world views Down syndrome. When that experience is successful on both sides, we consider ourselves partners with all these employers on the mission to change the way the world sees Down syndrome. So we are 100% about facilitating that successful experience and it starts by providing support. So I think that's a huge benefit to any organization in business. I'm not, I think that's pretty rare, um, but we know who our people are and we want that to be successful. And we know there's education, as Jeannie says, there's education and awareness building that goes right along with the process. So we're there to do that part. Um, lots of uh, wheels spinning in my head here as I'm, as I'm thinking. Uh, and, and I think one of the things that's, um, I'm thinking through is if I were trying to, uh, question my, my own self in terms of, uh, going through the hiring process, someone, I mean, one of the things that I always think about is, uh, you know, businesses usually operate on some degree of cash, right. And, and, and pay, how, how does that compare? I mean, is that, is that an equivalent to, uh, what, what does that look like? Jean, you want to take that one? Well, I think you may actually have more experience with that because I, you know, with the employers that you've placed, you know, with the employees that you've placed. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, okay. I, I, um, we it. ask, we don't usually actually even ask. Typically the experience is, We'll respond when asked, but typically my experience thus far is that everyone understands 
that this is a, this is a this is a large need across the greater employment picture and so they understand their place at the forefront of starting this kind of initiative or movement or example and they want to lead with 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 a lot of positivity so they're generous and i i think that's a fantastic thing we will weigh in on on what we think is appropriate, but for the most part, so far, everyone has been very, more than fair, um, and and we appreciate that. So let, let me replay that back to you to make sure I'm 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 digesting properly, and and that is uh, look a lot a lot of people who are doing this it it, it may, I think at this point in time it's it's somewhat of a non traditional route, and I think right. people recognize that, and as a result of that, yeah, sure they're they're inheriting some risk in trying this non traditional route, but you know. Uh, People invest in the unicorn companies because nobody else has invested in them yet so that they can see the great appreciation of, of uh, and return on that investment. So you have an opportunity here to build and draw from a talent pool that others haven't gotten into yet. And you ultimately have that final control yourself over to what happens. I mean, you can always say no, uh, but hopefully this is not a matter of you just saying no uh, as a black and white. It's This is more about finding a match that all parties benefit from it. Is that a fair way of saying the same thing? Absolutely. And, and I would add that, we, you know, as, as Kim goes through this whole process with the employer and then finding a, part, a GG participant that she has um, worked already with, typically knowing kind of their skill set and things as well, you know, she brings the family in as well, because at that point then, and, and we do do the job coach part, but the family is introduced as well to, to um, discuss about actually scheduling um, and in regards to what they want their child to be working. Um, you know, we have some families who um, only want a couple of days a week. Um, there's a couple who, you know, there's a couple families who, who don't mind it to be five days a week. Um, but then there, as, as you mentioned, um, in regards to pay, that also is a component um, because there are um, services that um, many of our adult participants do get services. So there's a there's a balance um, of all those different factors um, come into play when there is a decision about employment, um, because, again, this is a new this is a new thing for our population. So I don't think that they all um, know what everybody doesn't consider that um, as being a a potential opportunity, but now we're introducing that as an opportunity. Um, so it's um, it's balancing all those different factors. And I think every family is very different um, in regards to where they um, are willing to, um, you know, have the employment piece be part of their, their child's future. Yeah. So I, I think a very, very important uh, component here, right? I mean, just like every person is different, every situation is different, right? And it needs to be considered on its own merits. Uh, what I think I heard from you, and, and I, I, we hadn't even talked about this, it doesn't necessarily have to be a full-time type role it, because there's many considerations. So there is flexibility. And again, it, it, it's, it's not very difficult. I mean, different from typical. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, it, it has to be considered on its own merits. So there's a range of capabilities. It's about narrowing down. What am I looking for? Who am I looking for? And I got to imagine Kim in that process, you say, I want somebody who's here, you know, 8 AM to 12 PM every Monday through Friday. Well, that's a consideration that changes who we look for as opposed to somebody who I only, I need them three days a week on Monday, uh, Wednesdays and Fridays, for example. So based on the situational need, that's kind of what Kim, you or uh, someone else in the organization will kind of help narrow down filter to find the right people for that. That's exactly right. I also, I think I also have a unique opportunity to really, really um, mm. get the employer, the potential employer to really explore that flexibility. I think there are assumptions oftentimes on the employer side as well, that employment for a person with Down syndrome needs to mean X for a number of days a week or number of hours. I think there's a, there's sometimes can be some assumptions there. So oftentimes part of the first conversations I'm having are, are about the lack of employment that exists for our folks with Down syndrome. That's a big one. The fact that if you offer a job even one day a week, certainly we would love it to be more. Certainly there are families that have their own, as Jeannie is saying, um, 
really effectively. There are families who have their own expectations about where a job fits for their adult child in their life at the moment. But even if you offer it at one day a week or two days a week, that is a step so worth taking. So let's explore that flexibility on scheduling, on amount of hours per shift. Um, I think sometimes there can be a bit of an assumption with, with caution on it that looks like, I think if I'm going to hire somebody with Down syndrome, I'm going to have to put them to work in my building from, like you said, nine o'clock to five o'clock. That's not necessarily the case. We can find all sorts of things that just make the match work. Days of week, hours of day, rate of pay, um, and certainly the task list specifically. I want to say one other thing that I think is really, really important about what Gigi's does and how we approach this, uh, this employment process specifically. And that is this. When I make a match or somebody like me makes a match for a potential employee with a potential employer, one of the other driving forces is that we are looking for, we are looking to put ourselves out of a job in that situation eventually. We are not looking to event, essentially where we are in our program right now. Maybe we'll have this element to it, but we don't have it now. We are looking to find a person who will eventually no longer need us. And that that job is 100% typical in that it's between that employer and that employee and the family, because we know we need that support, that there's not a need for a forever job coach. There's not a need for forever daily support or, or shift support, so to speak, whatever, whatever those shifts are. It is a, it is a, a job that, will, that that person can do 100% independently without a job coach and that that is a typical experience going forward we will always be there as a support forever and ever um, to help in any way shape or form that we would be needed beyond the point that the job coach rolls off but that's the ultimate goal that that person has their own job theirs not theirs and the job coaches theirs that's i mean that is beauty in the work world when you see it it's phenomenal I can, I can only imagine and there's, there's nothing more empowering to me or what makes me feel good was when I see somebody else that just feels empowered. You can just see the glow. Absolutely. Right? And that's, there's not much you can stop them from doing at that point. <laughs> and the glow comes from both sides. When yeah. you see an employer figure out how to make that successful and be able to talk about it and say, okay, guys, get on board. Like I'm doing this and this is how, and you can do this too. Now, I maybe didn't think I could do it as well as I'm doing it, but I'm doing it as well as I am today. I want to tell you about it. Like there's a glow on that side too. Highly recognizable and equally as important. Well, I, I see we're coming closer to, to the tail end of our time. And, and one of the things that I always think about for myself is sort of the revelations that I'm having. So, you know, where the, 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 ha, the light bulb moment. Um, what, she, if, if you can share with me uh, some of those light bulb moments for maybe some of these employers, kind of where did they start and where did kind of their end, what, what, what appeared to them that they wish they had known at the beginning of the process? Does that make sense? Absolutely. Here's, here's, here's one thing I hear every single time, bar none, that the, the impact on the rest of the staff, whoever that might be, the impact on the rest of the staff was so incredible in terms of joy, in terms of expansion of mindset, in terms of understanding and, and um, just all the positive things you can, all the attributes you can think of in that, in that area, you could pro pretty much apply to that. The impact to the rest of the staff was far greater than had, was expected in the beginning. I think most people know that the that an ad of an individual with Down syndrome on as an employee will be a fantastic thing for the company. At the very least, they're very hopeful toward that, and we're confident that it will. But they don't understand that the rest of the people who that person is working with, whether it's a direct interaction on a daily basis or an indirect interaction when they're there, is huge. Um, it's absolutely huge. I have heard stories about uh, more introverted employees becoming much more interactive with that person hardened folks with maybe a bit more hardened personality, older, set in their ways, like whatever, whatever. I don't, I don't say that to be critical, but softening and being welcoming and stepping up to the plate. I've heard 
people tell me that it is a sad day in their life when they are not there on the same day as that employee, because those interactions are just so joyful that they, they, you know, they feel the absence of it. So that's definitely, that's definitely the number one thing that I hear consistently every single time. I will tell you from personal experience that uh, in just from having a family member, uh, my son, uh, it is amazing to me. I think this world could suffer to have more empathy and people acting out of compassion from that empathy. Uh, it is amazing to me how my son, out of the five of us sitting at the dinner table, will just sit there quietly and he'll just light all of us up. We'll be in stitches just because he says something so poignant because he's been listening. Yeah. And like, I mean, it, 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 my wife and I look at each other like, where did that come from? That's so, the timeliness of that was so incredible. It changes the room. That's it. it. Yeah. It changes the office too. Yeah, well, absolutely. If, if, um, if someone would like to get in touch to find out more, just to ask questions and understand more, you know, they don't have to be ready to pull the trigger on bringing somebody in. Are you all open to having people reach out to you and connect with you? Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just contact um, Gigi's playhouse.org slash Raleigh. Um, and you know, our website, you can send either a message or you could call the playhouse. Um, and, um, you know, we can have a discussion because like you said, yeah, it's not about, you know, pulling the trigger right now. It's about learning and exploring. Um, I really encourage people to come and take a tour and to learn about Gigi's playhouse to start just learning about our, um, what we do, um, learning about um, this population and um, again, education and awareness um, and, you know, and then potential opportunity. But um, we're all about, um, you know, really being part of the community. And, um, you know, the more that we can get out there for people to learn about us, um, the better. Absolutely. Well, for anybody who's been listening in, hopefully this is opening up a blind spot that you may have had. It was definitely one for me for the longest time. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Jeannie and, and Kim where it kind of started to open up a whole new world to me. So thank you for listening in, but uh, Jeannie and Kim, thank you for spending some time shedding some light on this, on this population that leaders in our community, actually across the globe can really tap into. And, and for the work that you're doing at Gigi's Playhouse, creating that platform where people can say, I, I know how to go about this now. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for having us. Absolutely.